Hello everyone, you are about to listen to the teaching of Pastor Raymond Burnett, pastor of Mana Worship Center. We hope that you will learn from the message you are about to hear and to realize that books will inform, but the Bible has the power to transform you. Now sit back and open your mind and heart for God to speak to you. Father, thank you very much for the privilege we have today to come together again in the name of your son Jesus. We appreciate your loving kindness and your tender mercies towards us. I am your son. I am your child. And I'm doing my best, my very best to be obedient to you. Um, I told you something this morning that I am not about to repeat right now and pray just came back to my mind. But today I am praying that you give me the ability to share clearly exactly what you have laid upon my heart and within my spirit, man. And that all of our spirits will connect together in one today. Not just through our ears, but through our spirit, man. May the spiritual ears be tuned on so the spirit man will be fed. And from the spirit man, we will continue to live. We thank you and we give you praise in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Now, I don't like being far away from you. That is part of my problem. It has always been. When you've been a teacher at one time, you'll discover what I'm talking about. It's easy to get very close with the students because it's easier to interact with them. Um, I want to talk to you about the Church of Ephesus first. I want to talk to you about it. It's my favorite book. I've said that to you many times. I've studied, I've, done, I've, I've taught it at least three times. And he's tugging at me again. He didn't tell me to teach it again yet but it may become something that we will do. There's another thing we're going to do. Let me tell you this, and I need it to be on recording because it will benefit all the people who listen to us on Sundays. We are going to do a series of teaching. We call it Bible study. I've been asking God for a building where we can do a Bible study. And then he said to me, the Bible study attendance wouldn't be the greatest and therefore you will not have maximum use. I said, okay, I understand. So what do you have in your mind? He said, I'll tell you. Have you ever had a conversation with God, your father, as if you and him just sitting at the table and you have a little discussion? Well, when I talk to God, this is what I do in my head. I'm sitting across from the table and he's right there. He said, can you imagine if one Sunday morning you start church at wherever you start church and you finish church at a certain time, and you say to the folks at the at church, um, let's have a little snack like we normally would do. He said, um, and you say to them, I need you to stay here for another 35 to 40 minutes. We need to do a Bible study. I said, how that's going to work? He said, can you imagine that? I said, I can imagine that. He said, um, that's possible for you to do. So they don't have to come back in the week for a Bible study. I said, oh, that makes sense. And if the light bulb just only went on for me. Did you hear what I just said there? I said, went on. We take a break and we pull up chairs, Bible study. And let it be interactive to the point where people who are listening to it over the whatever can have a place that they can type in, what do you mean by that? The question will be asked. And on the spot, you respond. So the people can also do the same thing. He said, you can kill two birds with the same stone. He said, I got you. The other side I just said to you. So that may become one of the spin of what our church will begin to do. Amen. I'm sharing what he's talking to me about. I want you to understand so you can follow what we're doing. So Ephesians might be a book that we study again. However, let me talk to you about the book of Ephesians. Let me talk to you about Paul. I was thinking about him very much. The Apostle Paul is one of those fantastic, wonderful individuals that you'll ever meet. Um, he had these missionary journeys. We all know that he became a convert about 30 years old. He used to be a Pharisee, and Pharisees uh, began early in life, but when they get to be 30, 31, 32, 33, that's when they're in the prime of life. He was a Pharisee. Christ started his ministry when he was 30 years old. There's something in the culture that connects to 30 years. 
Whenever a young man hits 30, he would have had to already prepared everything he needed to establish his family. Everything. Many of them marry young, very, very young. When the girl hits 14 years old, somebody can ask for her in marriage. 14. The young man had to make sure that they would have already had a place where he's going to bring her to. That's the biblical concept. Bring her to. He had to plant his vineyard for a number of reasons. Number one, he had to provide food for her. Because in that culture, they never had dating. Follow me now. He had to get to know her. The getting to know her happens after the ceremony, not before the ceremony. In every sense of that word. Culturally, that's never an issue anymore. That's not a concern. Follow this now. He planted the vineyard. Why? Because in their culture, the young men had to go to war. While he is married, he can't do that. He's not allowed to do that. He also had to prepare food for that first year of marriage so that they will get to know one another and he doesn't have to go work. That's a nice program. <laughs> he just get to know the person. You don't have to work. Don't have to go and slave. That is your get to know the person period in life. Children come after that. The raising of children is all very, very different. I don't want to get into that now because I won't get back to this. But the raising of how they raise children. The men were extremely important in the concept of raising of the family. Not just the women. You understand what I'm saying to you here now? They understood what was happening. So when the father had the children grown and everything else, now you'll understand this part, that when a man, just before he dies, he had the responsibility of blessing every one of his children. So the fatherly blessing is important. Remember Jacob and Esau. Remember Isaac. Remember he had to pray for them. Remember that concept. And he declared promises and blessings in the children's life. Remember when Jacob later on had his children going on, the 12 sons, before he died, he did the same thing. Remember when Joseph had his two boys come to father, and then he switched his hand, and just said, you're doing the wrong thing, dad. You put your right hand on the left hand. Which, no, 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 I know I'm doing. He blessed the second born more so than the first. There's a prophetic thing. There's a prophetic fulfillment in the blessings of your children from the father. But Pastor, how about those who don't have fathers? But that's the sad breakdown in our system. When the father is missing, the mother has to be both. Her blessing is just as powerful as the man when he is not there. So mom, when you prayed for your son and spoke life into his body, hubby wasn't there. Ex-hubby wasn't there. No matter what the name is, he wasn't there. You filled into that role. You became Josh Ray's umbrella of protection. Mothers, that's who you are when there's no father around. You got to be both father and mother. God give you a double portion for that one, double blessing I call it, because you have to carry both roles. But here's the most difficult part of that. It's hard for mothers to raise men to become young men to become fathers and men. Needs a father to help a young man to become a, a man. But he has to be actively in the child of, child's life. Do you understand that? Those of you young people, young men, you've got quite a task. Very important task. Amen. Thank you, Sister Tisha. Got it. Amen. So, Paul was a Pharisee. Um, he had this very religious conviction about himself. I've got to be fast with this because the way it's working inside of me, I don't really ever get to finish this, but I'm hoping to finish a certain point. He was zealous about his religious faith. Very staunch Jew. Very religious. Pharisee, the most rigid you can ever find. When they are going to copy anything like the scribes do, they had to go to certain ritual to even name the name or even 
write the name of God down. They have to wash from the tip of the fingers to the elbow. Cleanliness is important. It's all, it was all an external religious practice. It was not based on the inside. It was external. Follow this now. They tried to follow the Old Testament to the T, even though they knew it was impossible to do it. So they devised some extra laws called fence laws. These were the extra laws that they put in place to protect you from breaking the real law. That's twice as hard. It's, so, it's bad enough to keep the real one. You give me the external ones too. Yeah, that's part of the problem. Where, that's where Jesus had the issue. Jesus' issue was connected to breaking their fence laws. That's what they're fighting him about. They didn't take the time to understand what the real law was. So, for example, why are you eating your food without your hands washed? We know for hygiene purposes, it's a great thing to do. But it's not big enough to condemn a person or to want to kill them. Are you here with me? So, Paul had a lot of things in his background. They believe in resurrection. The Sadducees didn't believe in it. There are a lot of things that were different. So this man, Paul, was zealous about his faith and discovered that this man, Jesus, came and died on the cross and um, some people had believed in him and Paul was upset with that thing like you wouldn't believe it. He decided, I'm going to do the Sanhedrin, the group of 70 people there. I'm going to get some permission from them. And I want to be able to kill everybody. Everybody will be killed who name themselves after the name of God. He was adamant about that. Now, if you ask Paul, do you think that was the will of God for you? Paul would answer yes. And some of you are thinking, I don't even know what my purpose is. Remember some of you mentioned something like that. In Paul's mind, that was my purpose, to get rid of all these people who claim that Yeshua is the Savior. I got to get rid of them. Ask him if he thought it was his purpose. He would say yes. But one day he had an interaction with God on the road to Damascus. We all know that he had his domestic experience. And he became blind, and he had to go to this man who had to pray for him and everything else. And the man was scared out of his wits because he thought, if this man come to my house and discover him, he would be dead. Because God had to bribe him first. God had to take his sight away temporarily. It's amazing, you know. God is strategic in his plan. It, can you imagine Paul was not down but still awake? Still, see, adamant in his heart. He had to discover there is somebody bigger than him. And the person who was bigger than him was God. And the one who was bigger than him caused him to become blind and said, go to this man's house. It's the only way you get to see. He got there. And he said, the man will tell you what to do. No problem. God had to talk to the man and get him ready. When he finally got there, things got sorted out. We all know his sight came back. And we all know what happened after that. He became baptized. And it was somebody's responsibility to introduce him to the church. The church, the first place Paul was being introduced to, they were scared. They were scared. You bringing Paul into our assembly? The same man who killed everybody? The man who killed, was that, it was at Paul's feet that the clothing of those that stoned Stephen was placed. The evangelist, yeah. Paul was the man telling, get rid of this man. It was at his feet, his clothes were thrown. So Paul had quite a destructive aspect to the church. And God said to him, Paul, you see that same church you're trying to destroy? You're going to suffer a lot of things for that church, man. The wheels are going to be torn. You're going to be in the hot seat. Paul said, I'm good. I'm ready for that. We all know what happened. He kept on for a little while. He went to the desert area for three years. and believed that when he got a hold of God and God got a hold of him. A little summary about Paul because they need to understand where I'm going with this. And then one day, um, there's fasting and praying in the church of Jerusalem. And a prophet in the church spoke. Prophets are still real today. But we oftentimes have been exposed to some who are not very biblical, nor who are not allowing themselves to be led by God. And listen to this. And the church world has become very sadly misguided. Why? Because if a person who is called a prophet comes into the church, 
everybody in the church wants to get a personal word from the prophet. They used to record them and give it to you. And then you have to pay a little bit of money to get it. Well, biblically speaking, there's nothing biblical about that. And if there's a prophet by chance who might get to listen to this, which is happening right now, recorded in Toronto, I want to say to you that every single time you charge someone for that word, you are doing an unscriptural thing and you're misleading somebody. And I say that to you straight up in your face. Do you understand that? And it's not condemning. It's just getting people to understand what's biblical and what's not. Including you don't order water through the mail to send back some money to anybody. You don't need an extra vial, a different vial of oil because it came from Israel. So you can anoint yourself with praise. Not the oil that caused the healing in your body. It's your faith in God that brings the healing in your body. Do you understand what I'm saying to you? I just, I just want you to keep that clear. Keep it above board. Keep it biblical. Keep it real. And we have been misleaded, misguided, and misled oftentimes in our church world. I am for the church. I believe in the church. I believe in prophets, evangelists, pastors, teachers, and apostles. I believe it's still biblical. There's a function for each person. However, there's also an abuse and misuse of that position, including in the position of pastors. That's a good spot to say amen. amen. Now, I didn't prepare that. That was not any piece of paper I have. Just following him. We are being set up for something big and powerful as a people. I just want you to know that. Amen. Now, anyway, Paul ended up going on a missionary journey. He had three of them. First missionary journey, second missionary journey, third missionary journey. Anyway, at the end of the second missionary journey, um, he came to a place that's called Ephesus, but he only stayed there for a short period of time. Short period of time. In and out. That wasn't his real trip. And then he said to them, he promised them, he promised them, I will come back. That's the number one thing I want to say to you. Anyone who's actually of God, biblically, solidly based in God, and in a position of any form of leadership or whatever influence you have, any time and every time you give your word, always keep that word. People are sheep who are being led. The shepherd's responsibility, the apostle, the prophet, the evangelist, the pastor, when you give that kind of leadership to people, they are going to take your word as if God is telling you to tell them. So if I say I'll be back next Sunday, I will be back next Sunday. If I'm not going to come, I'll tell you I'm not going to come. Well, we know situations happen, and you got to let somebody know, by the way, please apologize to me, I can't make it. But, do not give words that you're not able or willing or capable and honest enough to keep. It's ungodly. It's not right. Did you get that? Yes. I will never do that to you. That's my promise. There's a little thing I'm going to tell you shortly. And I, I said to him, I said, God, I don't want to cry when I'm telling you on that one. I, I, I negotiate crying time with him, but it doesn't always work. <laughs> I negotiate. Oh, Lord. I was doing a little study as one night, one morning or night, I don't remember what it is, I was going through some of the scriptures that Paul is writing and I was breaking up right in, in the basement there and the water's running over my paper and I put the paper over there and I put another sheet of paper and I run at that one, I put another sheet of paper. I, keep, I said, God, can, can we stop this? There are some parts of God and his message that breaks you up on the inside when you have a genuine heart towards him. It is the state of the heart that determines the response of the person. Did you hear that? The state of the heart. The spirit man's heart. So Paul kept his word. He went back to Ephesus. Acts chapter 18 and chapter 19. If you want to do history in that, Acts 18, Acts 19 will tell you about his trip. When he got there, he, um, he taught them some stuff. In fact, when he got there, there are not a lot of people. There were about seven of them that were present, just seven men. He used to go to the synagogue, and for about three months, he went to the synagogue and dialogue. That's how he wanted to grow people. He wanted to convince them, because the synagogue was home for him. 
as a Pharisee, he go anywhere in the synagogue. And by the way, when you are a leader in that category, when you go, they ask you to say something. That was a culture. They'll ask any visiting Pharisee or leader in that component to make a statement. Remember when Jesus went to the temple? They offered it to him, and he opened the text. It was the part of the custom. Any visiting leader in that concept was asked to say something, to read a scripture. And Jesus opened Luke. We read in Luke and Isaiah. He said, now the Spirit of God is upon me, for he's anointed me to be. And he, he, he kept on going. And closed the book when he got to a certain spot and sit down. And everyone, Who are you? He was talking about himself in that text. That's what caused them to become so concerned. He didn't finish the text. And he said, today is that scripture fulfilled in your ear. You got to be kidding me. You are telling us in this place that Isaiah prophesied about you. You got to be kidding. We don't do it here like that. Can you shake everybody's face up? And hopefully by the grace of God, if Christ came into this church today, I hope there won't be too much he has to shake up for us. I hope I've been trying my best to sit and point with him. That's the thing that scares me the most. It does scare me a bit. A bit, a lot. It scares me a lot because I, I don't want to ever mislead anyone from what the truth is for any reason. Because I do have to give an account for the place and the position that I have. It's called a shepherd's reward. And I'm not doing it because I don't want to forfeit it. I just want to be doing it because it has to be the right thing to be done. I hope you don't do things because a reward is promised you. You do it because it is the right thing to do. Amen. Amen. And I'm calm. I'm really calm. I'm, I'm holding it down here. So Paul, um, he loved the people. He has never stayed a long time, with the exception of Corinthians, he, Corinthians a year and a half. He stayed at Ephesus for approximately three years. It's the longest he had ever stayed at any one spot, any place he's ever been on any of his journeys. There's something about the people at Ephesus that did something inside of his heart. He stayed there. And then an uproar broke up. A kind of uproar broke up. Then, then he had to leave. And then he moved from the synagogue, went to a house church, and they began to go. When he got there, listen to the best part. When he got there, he, he made a comment to them. He said, um, into whose baptism were you baptized? And they all said, John's. We said, no, no, John's baptism is one of just repentance from sins. But there's another baptism that's available for you. He said, we haven't even heard of that one. And he said, therefore, I'm going to baptize you in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. He said, have you received the Holy Ghost since you believe? He said, no, no, no. We haven't even heard that there's such a receiving of the Holy Ghost. Wow, he said. Come, business. This is church for me, he said. Baptize them. Then lay hands on them. And everybody begin to talk in tongues. I envision one day. I would love to see that happen at our church. I, to be honest with you. This is the honest truth. I would love to see that happen in our church. In every church. Where the presence of God flow through that place. And a simple laying on of hands. It doesn't have to be my hand only. So bang, bang tongues flowing out. You get baptized by speaking in tongues. And if everybody talk in tongues at the same time, nobody will ever think we're crazy. <laughs> Can you imagine what that sound will sound like as if we are in the book of Acts chapter 2 all over again. You know the reason that some of us are not getting the experience is because we are too conscious of how we may sound and whether I'm going to fall down on whether I'm not I'm going to lose control of who I am. I was like that, I know. Somebody told me you're too controlled. I said, I didn't think I was controlled. I said, I just want to make sure it's real. <laughs> and I don't want to whimper. I don't want to practice. I remember this lady used to pray in my ear when I was a young man. Pray, pray, pray. And she said, say this after me. And she rambled off something. I have a clue what it sounds like. 
And I didn't open my mouth to try it one bit. Don't let anybody tell you what words you should repeat. It's your experience, not theirs. Do I believe in speaking in tongues? Absolutely. Do I believe there's a language that you, you get? I believe that. I believe there are times when you can pray in that language and Satan doesn't have a clue what you're saying. I believe that 100%. I believe you can ramble off a whole lot of things and talk to God and say, what's that? He said, mind your own business and we keep on going with God. I love that aspect. I love that experience. It's a real experience, by the way. It's for real. It doesn't, su it doesn't support the point that if you don't speak in tongues, you're not spiritual. It's not true. The numbers of people who don't speak in tongues are very good spiritually. Talk to the Baptist brothers. They don't believe in speaking in tongues. They don't believe as of God. So we'll go as far as say you're demon possessed if you do. Whether they believe that or not doesn't make any condemnation for me. I talk in tongues if I have to. Do you hear that? You got me? I'm still taking my time. I want you to get the, the, the flavor of the heart of God today. He said, I want, see, son, I'm setting you up. He said, I know you're setting me up. So, Paul, <sighs> laid hands, they all spoke in tongues, and the church began to do all kind of wonderful things. Not very long after that, Paul took off, and he ended up in prison. The man who started the church ended up in prison. Tychicus was the one who continued the church. Pete, and even Timothy went there a number of times. They had these roving people. They move around the places. So like, for example, let me give you a sample of what happens. I want you to get the image in your mind. Because I think this is where God's leading us as a church too. They had, the church of Ephesus was a combination of many house churches. They didn't have synagogues and mosques and whatever else we call them now and big massive buildings like we have now. These meet in homes. So the church of Ephesus was a combination of homes where people meet. Do you understand that? All right? So when Paul come, came into Ephesus, he would go from one house to the next house to the next house, every single house he would go to. There used to be the, the house of Tyrannus. It's a school. They met there also. But there are some areas that that wasn't searching, so they would go to house churches. Remember when Peter was in prison in the book of Acts? And remember when the people were praying all night that he'd be re re released from prison? Yeah. All right? And remember that when the angel of the Lord let him out, he went straight to the house where John Mark was a little boy. Knocked at the door, and the little girl inside the prayer meeting going on there opened the door, says, Peter. And they said, no, no, it can't be Peter. That's the spirit. That's church word for you, yeah? That's the spirit. Kept on knocking, opened the door. John Mark, who actually went to Paul with Paul on the first missionary journey, who turned back when he got halfway, was exposed to that experience. Peter got risen, delivered from the prison, from the prison, house church. He came to that home. That was his center. That was the place he had fellowship with. But he also went to the other homes and other houses in that same area where they were. Do you understand that? Yes. House churches. So the mega churches that we have, fantastic, praise God for them. I, I'm happy for that. Because they reach people that nobody else can reach. There's all kinds of type and styles of churches. But the success of the church is not determined by the size of the church. Do you understand that? It's not determined by the size. One person said to me once, I hope we never grow big. And I said, don't do that. I said, when you grow big, what are we going to do? I said, you can grow big and still be personable. I talked to a friend of mine that's person is in the States. She said, um, she's been in the States for a little while. She said, you know, um, I went to visit this church for about six or seven months and I was taking out the right hand of fellowship classes with them and I want to go and I told them, I'm leaving, I'm leaving to go away for about three weeks or whatever time it is. And she had given the number for me, two or three persons. She said, we won't believe what happened. I said, tell me what happened. She got a call from one of the key persons in the church. She said, hey, I just thought I'd touch base with you because you told us that you were leaving to go away. We just want you to know that we miss you. We look forward to having you back. I said, that must make you feel wonderful. She said, yes. Why? Because the people in that church cared enough to call her. Remember I said to you back when we were at the school, the other school, the other location, 
about giving your phone numbers and we want to create a little telephone directory so we keep in touch with one another. You know, most of us have not done it. He didn't tell me to tell you this. All of this coming up with the same. God is amazing, eh? God's bringing us a little bit of order for us. He's trying to help us to understand what genuine love and care is all about. Now, we haven't done that yet. We haven't done it. We haven't created it. We haven't given it out. We, do all the other we haven't done that. And at the time, you thought I was just talking, talking, talking. Maybe, maybe you did. Whether you did or not, here's the point I'm making. Here is somebody who's saying, I have only been going there for a few months. Now I am feeling that I am a part of them because somebody reached out to me. If there's never any other thing that I desire for us to have for our church is when people choose to become a part of us and they're not here. Like today, I looked around and I'm thinking, I've seen this Debbie, I haven't seen this, I haven't seen that. I'm like, wow. Now, didn't, we have va- didn't we have valid reasons for not being there? It's the point I'm making. <laughs> That's not the question. The question is reaching out and saying, I miss you, is basically all that sometimes people need. That's that. But if we don't have a number, how would we reach out? Amen. Amen. Alright, so hurry up and fill in the forms. <laughs> now that's just, just an aside. I think Jesus did that too. <laughs> Let me finish telling you about Jesus and Paul. So he left, he ended up in jail. He wrote a number of letters while he was in jail. And one of the letters he wrote, he was in jail, was the book of Ephesians. This was a man who loved the people and who decided, I'm going to write them a letter. The Spirit of God wants me to write them, to encourage them. What motivated him was this. In the beginning of his letter, the church of Ephesus, Paul had received a report of how they were doing. Ah, this is the part I get really excited He got this report of how the church was doing. He said, I have heard that your faith has become known all over the place and your love is great. Unlike the church of Corinth, I have heard in Corinth that there's a mess in the church since I've left. Two different kinds of church. Paul started both. A year and a half versus three years. But they had a lot of struggles in this church. The city named Corinth reflected in the church. The church of Ephesus had its own God problem too. But it wasn't as messed up as Corinth. Listen to this. Every church has a flavor of the city within which it is. We are in Toronto. Toronto is called a meeting place. Toronto is a multi kind of faceted kind of city. Our church ought to be able to reflect that. But the spirit in the city has a way of coming into the church because we are part of the city and we bring it with us. Here's the point. When we come, we got to learn to grow so that spirit will begin to mm, get out of us and replaced by a real spirit. Are you getting this? You're in a good place today. I said you are in a good place today. Amen. Amen. I'm in a good place today. I'm in the church of God right now with you. Now, let me give you a couple of things. Go in your Bibles because I want you to see it in your Bible. I don't want you to believe just what I'm saying to you. I can quote this to you all day long. Ephesians 1. Ephesians 1. That's what he said. He started out the first part of the thing, but let's go down to verse um, 15. I didn't read the beginning, just 15. Wherefore, on behalf of all the things you're talking about before, wherefore I also, listen to this, after I heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and love 
unto all the saints. How did it motivate Paul? He decided he's going to pray for them. Mm. Did you hear that? After I heard about your faith, and after I heard about your love, it motivated me to pray a prayer for you that I give you a handout about. It's called Ephesians chapter 1 from verse 15 to almost the end. The first prayer he made for them. He said, I cease not. Cease not to give thanks for you making mention of you in my prayer. And he gave us a whole list of things that he prayed for. You have a copy of that prayer. I give you a handout of that. Please read it to see what Paul was praying. I want you to talk to you about this one now. Many times in every church, our prayer request is oftentimes based on problems or struggles or difficulties. When last did you ever pray for positive things? You may ask somebody. That's the point I'm making here. Paul is saying, I am praying for you as children of the Most High God. I am praying because I've just heard about your faith. I've heard about this. I need, I need to add to what I've just heard. I want to put some other stuff into your life. So when you're going to pray for me, don't wait until you hear something bad about me to pray for me. Pray for me when you heard me do a, a good thing. <laughs> you hear me now? But when you pray for one another, don't pray because I can't get along with that sister, that brother. Man, Lord, I don't even know how to pray for this one anymore. Uh, no, no, God. But there was a time, Father, when I noticed the person that they be. Thank God for those positive things that you have observed in the other person's life and pray that that will become even more reinforced and then God will add other substance to that person's life. That's how he wants us to begin to start praying. Are you following the instructions yet? Don't wait until we only have negative things to pray about. Have you ever noticed that most churches, if I hear something negative about a church, I come and tell you, let's pray for that church. I do that too. When I say they ever come to you, I'm talking about myself, transparent before you. When I say come to you, say, Saints, I want us to pray and thank God for this church down the road that just bought a building for $5 million and they're growing. Pastors don't do that. We don't advertise that they got a building that's doing really well. We don't pray for them that God will continue to allow them to grow and break down the city for the kingdom of God. But if they're having problems, we pray, God, may you, you know, you know, we need to change our thinking of how we pray. Are you hearing this now? Are we good here? So Paul prayed. Paul prayed. This is what he prayed. He prayed this prayer. He gave them a prayer that is listed there. The one that I want to get to chapter 3. Before we get there, I want to tell you a little thing about why you're here. Why we're here. I want you to understand this. I want you to never forget this. I may never say it again. I don't know. I have three or four specific categories that I pray into the life of our church. I want you to know one of the key responsibilities of every pastor is to A, pray for the people that he pastors. Simon says, woe be unto me if I don't pray for the people. And when I pray for you, I don't, call the God, put, I don't lump you all together in the same category because you all don't have the same needs. I pray for you individually. I call you by your own name. Do you understand that? And I've said this many times before. I used to think I can't memorize the names of everybody that I gave pastor to. Remember when a church that we passed in Toronto was about 350 people, and I said, God, I, I think you better stop this thing from growing because I won't be able to know. He said, hey, stop a little bit. Let me remind you of something you said to yourself a long time ago. I didn't remember this. God knows the record of everything I said. Have you noticed this, Sheila? He reminds you of things you said a long, long time ago, and you and I have forgotten it. God said, I have never forgotten anything you said, and I'm going to keep it. Whenever you say positive things about you, God always reminds you of the positive. You notice, he never reminds you of the real negative ones you say to ourselves. He always reminds you about the positive. He said, you told yourself one day, when you were teaching at this particular high school, that you, they had approximately 450 students in the school. You told yourself that if you taught every single cl class in that school or every category, that you would be able to memorize their names. Well, if you can memorize that and tell yourself that, why can't you memorize more than 350 people? Did you hear it? When you make a personal promise to God, God has a way of saying, 
You told yourself that you believe that you can do it, and I believe you can. I want you to know, not only can you do that with the students in the class, you can do it with people in the church. I said, hallelujah. I said, okay, I'm done. From that day, I stopped saying to the people, we're not going to grow any bigger. And we did. We did. So one of the greatest desires I have in my heart is to pray. And I try to make notes. Every time somebody new comes to a church, I write their names at the back and the person tells me the name. I write their name in the back of my Bible. I do. You know why? Hmm. This is amazing how to start this new year. I don't know. God is amazing. God here with me today. He, he said, just tell them this one. He said, when you read in the book of John, when Jesus said, I'm the good shepherd, he said, did I not tell the people, my children, that my sheep know my voice? He said, but I... I also know the sheep. I know the names of my sheep. My sheep know my voice and they follow me. Did he not say, I also know your name? Do you know, shepherds have a responsibility of naming their sheep. Just like we name dogs. My brother had a sheep and I had a goat. And um, he named his sheep and I named my goat. The difference between the sheep and the goat was this. The sheep was always obedient to my brother, and my goat will not follow any instruction I give to it. So I, I renamed the goat a number of times, and the thing didn't work. I think, well, this is strange. And I offer, from then I often wonder, why is it that sheep have a tendency to go astray, but they come back? But shepherd, goat never come back. Well, my goat never did. I have to go find him. My brother used to tie the rope of his sheep over his head. Leave it alone. Go do what you want to do. And it comes straight home. I said, my goat can do better than your sheep, man. Tied the whoop. Leave him. Didn't know where to find my goat. <laughs> when I became a Christian and I became a pastor, I said, God, this is amazing. Very powerful lesson. A sheep knows his voice. Not only that, but we know we named the sheep. He, know, I, he knows our name. He calls us by our name. When he said Abraham, when he said Abraham, when he said Abram, he knew his name. Saul, Saul, he knew Saul's name. Did he get that? So when God, when we have this intimate thing sometimes going, he said, son, and other times when he said Raymond, different tone. When God called me by, when he calls me by my first name, okay. Sometimes when I'm a little bit stubborn, he said, Raymond. Yeah, I got it. Has God ever called you by your name yet? Yes. Okay. God wants all of us to have a sense of intimacy with him. So when I pray for you, I don't just say, I remember that face. I don't go by your face. I go by your name. God doesn't remember us by our face. He remembers us by, his, by our names. Names are important to God. So when I call you by your name, it's because I want to pray with you. Right, Elvin? By name. A-U. God never say A-U. Did you hear that? You there. God never does that. God connects names because you understand the value of our name. And if our names have substantial meanings to them, every time he calls us by a name, he reinforces the meaning that is a part of our lives. And my son shall be called Yeshua, Jesus, Savior. Name him Jesus. Why? The name means Savior, just like Joshua. Every time you say Josh, you're saying, you have a call on your life that is related to the salvation of people. That's all he's saying. Amen. Amen. That's why I believe in knowing the meaning of your name. And if you have to change it, change anything. Change it. You might think I'm too old now. Make it a second name if you have to. Do you understand that? What does Marvin mean? She's going to investigate the meaning of her name. Investigate. You can go Google it too. 
See if you can get the meaning of your name. Because every time somebody caught, they reinforce it. Let me tell you the other thing. Don't worry, I'm not going to rush. I haven't even gotten into the text we have to talk about today. Amazing, eh? It's a good thing this is his church and not mine. He knows what he's doing, remember? That means you have to come back next Sunday. <sighs> Listen to this, saints. So my responsibility is to pray for you. Woe be unto the members of a church where the pastors never pray for them. I'm not here to take money from you only. And I will do that if there's a need. You understand that? I will never manipulate your pocketbook. I'll never give you any kind of hoax to make sure that I can get what you have. And for whatever the reasons are, that will never happen. Under the grace of God, never happens. But I'll pray for you. That's my promise to you. Did you hear that? It's my promise to you. Paul prayed. My, my example is Paul, Jesus prayed for them. In fact, before Jesus was choosing his 12 disciples, he went all night in a prayer and fast with his father. He said, God, you need to show me which of these guys I should hang out with for this period of time. And he gave him the list. We only heard about a few of them during the time, but others we never knew about them. But he got the list. Now, should we, I be the only one praying for, for you? You have a responsibility to pray for me. But you also have another responsibility to pray for one another. Remember that one another statement? This morning I'm driving out to church. <laughs> I'm driving out to church and he said, son, one another statement? I said, I got you, Lord, I got you, I got you. I said, I don't have the sheet with me today. You gotta, I'm going to pull it off for next week. And we got to finish our one another statements within our church. <coughs> When we get to those of you visiting, you know what I'm talking about. He said, pray one for the other. Well, when you pray for one another, call the person by their name. So you all have an equal responsibility to know each other's name. So take your little time. But pastor, I've got a bad... Listen to this. Don't ever declare and, and declare with your mouth again you've got a bad memory. Please. Nobody in this church should ever say that. I got a bad memory with names. I'm good with numbers, but I'm bad with names. Really? If your father in heaven has been able to know names and names and names, oh yeah, he's all powerful, all knowing. We know that. God said we are created in the image of God and we are now becoming like Christ. We can also have our minds readjusted and begin to remember names. Remember that. That's, that's it for you. This is your project this year. Help me to remember names. God, give me the ability to do that. Here's another thing I want to tell you. When he prayed about their faith, he thanked them about their love. Love must be consistently demonstrated among God's people all the time. I will always love you. We must always love one another. Let me explain to you. I told some of you my experience of what love is. And from that day, my life has radically changed. If you want to know what the genuine, honest kind of love that the Bible talks about in 1 Corinthians 13, memorize it and begin to pray it into your life. For one year, approximately nine months, I memorized 1 Corinthians. It didn't take me a whole year, but I memorized it. And I was given the responsibility to lead a group of young people in the city of Toronto at a church called Stone Church. I had only been in Canada for a short period of time, less than a year. Somebody had told them I used to work with young people once upon a time. Somebody understand that. And maybe this is great for you, Sister Arlette, because it's really powerful. All right? You already have the love for them. It's going to get even greater. And I realized it's a mixed church. It's a mixed group of people. We met every Friday night. We were going away on a retreat in Ottawa. The church had a big blue bus. Never forget it. We had about 30 or so young people in the bus. The gentleman who was driving, I remember, clearly remember him. He's driving the bus and we're there talking about everything. He's having fun. And then we got to, no, it was actually Peterborough. We got to Peterborough near to the Trent University and next to the Bible College area. We got there. We stopped the bus. And he looked at me. He said, we had prayed before we left. He looked at me. He said, okay. It's all yours. I said, okay, what do I do? God said, talk to them. Now, 
First time in my life to talk to them about this. The first trip I'm taking with them. I, I, I had gone on retreat before, but not as their leader. And I began to give them some rules and regulations like you wouldn't believe it. I said, now listen to me today. I don't want anybody doing this. I don't want anybody doing that. It reminds me of parents, right? I don't want anybody doing that. And I got down about four things on the list. And everybody looking at me. I said, they're getting scared. And he said, stop. The Lord just said to me, stop. I stopped. I just stopped. And I began to cry. Oh, gosh. I began to cry. I bawled like a baby in front of all of them. And then I said to them, just forget everything I just told you. Just go ahead and have fun. I finished my little crying. <laughs> they all walked off. We had a great time. I didn't understand what God was doing with me. I didn't have a clue. I've been praying, God, I would like to have a personal experience of all the qualities in 1 Corinthians chapter 13. I memorize it. I quote it. I want to experience this text. I didn't know how he's going to manifest the experience in my life. I didn't know what the context was. I didn't have to be standing in front of young people. I would not have chosen that. You don't have a choice in how it comes through, you know. From that day, is when I understood what love was. That was my love experience. Therefore, every time I am patient with somebody, I am saying to them, I love you. All the qualities in 1 Corinthians, every time we demonstrate, love believes all things. Every time I believe in somebody and believe them, I am saying, I love you. Do you know how skeptical we all can be? I think I, I'm going to take this one with a pinch of salt, we say. When I choose to believe you, it's because I'm saying I love you. But pastor, how about if they just lied? The responsibility of lying is not based on me. It's their responsibility to tell me the truth. I remember this one fellow, I was managing then. Man, there's one guy, he gave me a story why he couldn't come to work. I was like, really? Really? I didn't know he was really lying to me. I believed him. I said, good, no problem. I, I called in a personal day uh, for you. No problem. You get paid for it. Three or four weeks after that, he was breezy talking to somebody. And, da, 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 da. And, and the truth came out with him and this person. And the person said to me, uh, when he was off that day, I didn't know he did this. I said, he did what? And I went there and said, is there something you need to tell me? He said, uh, no. I said, about the day that I coded in a certain way. You were just bragging to somebody about X, Y, Z. I said, I believed you. I believed you. I didn't tell him anything. This is all I said, I believed you. He said, man, I'm sorry. I said, what do you want me to do about that? He said, can you go back into the system? I said, I've never done that before. If you can fix it, it's okay, he said. And because he said that to me, I said, it's all right. I'm good. I paid him anyway. I'll tell you a little secret about that. When First Corinthians 13 becomes a, re a real deep down experience, it revolutionizes your whole perspective in life and how you relate to people. I was asked to go to a function where this person was being honored. The person has done a lot of painful thing in my life. And I debated whether or not I should go or shouldn't go. But because it was a honoring experience for that person, I showed up. I went. I was quiet, stayed in a little side corner there. I went. At the end of the thing, I battled whether or not I should personally go. I thought, my presence here tells me I'm happy for you. That was me. My presence say I'm happy for you. <laughs> so I said, Father God, I should not have asked him. Ask God. I said, my presence here was just good enough. What do you think? <laughs> go over and congratulate him. Oh, gosh, Lord Jesus, help me, I said. 
So I just, okay, fine. I got out of my seat. I walked over. And he's coming down to this spot. And I reach out my hand. And I honestly said, congratulations to you. I did. And he reached forward to hug. And I had made a decision in my own heart that there's some people I will not hug again. <laughs> yeah, your past is not that perfect after all. Eh? There's a little chink in my garment here now. I, got it. I think if I, he said, so I don't, I said, you write down, you study this thing, you cry over the whole thing. Let me do it. I said, I'm almost done now. I haven't gone through it yet. He said, I need to set the stage because I want them to understand that being a leader is not just doing what you want. It's doing what the one who called you to do is. So he, and I hugged him. And I said, I whispered to him, I said, all the best to you. I walked away on the way home. I think my wife was actually, she was actually there too. She said, um, how are you doing? I said, I'm doing fine, thanks. I said, that was nice of you. I said, what was nice of me? He actually went over and shook his hand. I said, yeah, that wasn't me, that was God. I didn't take credit for that because up to me, I would not have gone. There's some things that love will cause you to do. That's not up to you. It's going to be up to God. Very true. Our church is going to experience a lot of things that relate to love. And we are going to have to love people unconditionally in every sense of the word. It's not up to us to withhold the demonstration of love. He's never asked us to do that. Love is patient. Love is kind. Love is not based on conditions. Love has no strings attached. Love, love, love. All he said, love for God. So do you know we have been the most vile, wicked people on planet Earth, but yet God loves us. Last thing I'm going to say. I pray for you. I love you unconditionally. I teach you the best way I know how. Because I want you to grow. It's always been my desire. And the fourth one is. I'd like you to have a hunger for people who are not saved. Because every chance we get, we are going to reach the lost for Christ. It's the only thing I know. Bow and pray. Father, it's been a casual, nice, kind of intimate, interactive, down to earth, right to, from your heart kind of day. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Th thank you for <laughs> bringing us to the place where I can just share a little bit of what you, I don't know why you had me write these things down at the beginning. I had hoped to get to wherever you thought, I, I probably thought I wanted to get, but you're setting a stage and a platform for us that is so big and humongous that we haven't seen anything yet. Thank you for my brothers and my sisters. Thank you for, for the opportunity of giving me the honor to give leadership to these individuals who are sitting within this place and even those who are not here with us today. I think of Rocky, I think of Wendy, I think of Debbie, I think of a number of people today. I thank you for Elvin's mom and sister that went back to Grenada. I thank you for bringing them back safely. I'm not going to ask if they went back, if they got back. I know that you have taken them back safely. I thank you for the young lady who was from Grenada and made a commitment of her life to Christ. And I heard that she was looking for church. I pray that you position one just for her. I thank you for those who have visited our church, who have always thought I want to go back. You can bring them back. We appreciate that. I thank you for those who consider this their church, and I pray that you strengthen them right now in the name of your son, Jesus. And all those movements that are happening within people's hearts and in their spirit, man, that is not of you. I come against those two in the name of Jesus. We give you praise and thanks in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you for taking the time to listen to our message presentation by Pastor Raymond Burnett. If what you have heard has been helpful to you, please tune in again or write us and let us know how this message has ministered to you. Our email address is pastor at mwctoronto.org or call us at 647-340-9252. We would love to hear from you. 
If you would like to support this teaching ministry, you can send a donation to our mailing address, 170 Oakwood Avenue, Toronto, Ontario, Canada, M6E 2T9. If you are in Toronto or surrounding area, our meeting place is at St. Charles Catholic School. Address is 50 Claver Avenue, Toronto. Thank you for listening.